Well, welcome to those who will be joining online. We are studying 2 Chronicles chapters 30, 31, 32, and carrying on. We just have a couple more weeks in this study. We're looking at the life of Hezekiah and how God worked powerfully and brought about the genealogy of Jesus Christ with God-fearing people, people who were godly in the midst of a corrupt um, world at that time, just like we face today. So let us pray. Father, we thank you so much for the goodness of your word. We thank you for the descendants of David as we look at the genealogy of Jesus Christ and as we celebrate his birth and we celebrate the coming of our Savior. Lord, we look at how you used people who were just like us, who cried out to you, who were excited to worship you. That's what we do here Sundays and Wednesdays and throughout the week. As we serve you, we encounter you, we experience you, we're equipped by you. May we be emboldened and revived to be your hands and feet, to be loving, to be kind, and to bring the gospel, the good news. Just like Hezekiah sent the Levites to bring good news that there was revival. May we bring that to this world that needs it so badly today. In your precious name we pray. Amen. So if you're here tonight, we picked up in chapter 29 and Hezekiah um, coming to rule. Ahaz died. He was an apostate. He basically fell away from the faith. And Hezekiah became ruler when he was 25 years old. As we look at that, uh, in his first year, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He repaired them. Remember, he helped the priests and the Levites. He gathered them in the east square. And he basically told themselves to sanctify themselves or set themselves apart. And he said, our fathers have trespassed in verse 6. They've shut the doors, verse 7. And therefore, the wrath of God fell upon Judah and Jerusalem, verse 8. He's making it clear that we have to get right with God because our fathers have transgressed. They've gone against God. So don't be negligent, verse 11. And the Levites arose and they did what they were called to do. They cleaned house. In verse 16, the priests, they went to the inner part of the house and they cleansed it. In verse 17, they sanctified or set apart the first day of the month and they came into the house of the Lord or the outside the vestibule. They sanctified the house in about eight days. And King Hezekiah said, we've cleansed all the burnt offerings with all its articles. They, they told him basically, we have the showbread and everything ready. And they basically fixed what Ahaz had broken. And in chapter 29, verse 20, Hezekiah, he rose, he gathered the rulers of the city and they brought seven bulls. They killed the bulls and they brought out goats and they killed the goats. The priest did it, and he stationed Levites in the house of the Lord with cymbals and stringed instruments. They had a worship concert like they had never had for over 214 years, 215 years. And when they finished the offerings and all that the king had asked them to do, they bowed and worshiped, verse 29. And King Hezekiah and the leaders commended the Levites to sing praises to the Lord. So some people say, well, the New Testament church, it's not the Old Testament. Yes, but we do a lot of things that were done in the Old Testament because it's the same God, it's the same worship, it's the same praise and adoration that He's worthy of. So there were 600 bulls and 3,000 sheep, all these animals, but there weren't enough priests, verse 34. And so they, they got a number of their brethren, the Levites, the tribe of Levi, to serve and to, because they were actually more diligent and they weren't tied down to the sins of King Ahaz. So the Levites stepped up and did some of the more specific roles of the priest. Now Hezekiah, he keeps the Passover. That brings us to chapter 30. Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah, and he wrote letters, and we talked about this last week, to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. For the king and his leaders, they all assembled in Jerusalem. And all the assembly in Jerusalem, they had agreed to keep the Passover in the second month. For they could not keep it at the regular time because they sufficient. Remember, the Passover, I believe, was celebrated in the first month. I think of Nisan. But because a sufficient number of priests had not consecrated themselves, they weren't ready. It's like they had a delay to getting started. Nor had the people gathered together in Jerusalem. They wanted to make sure that everybody showed up. Have you ever uh, had a rain check or put something off a little bit, but you still celebrated a, a birthday? Like we're having to do that tonight. You know, we wanted to celebrate last Monday. We're having to celebrate a week later. Have you ever celebrated a holiday because your family can't get together? 
until a later date or you celebrate it early. So that's exactly what's happening here with Hezekiah. And the matter pleased the king, all the assembly, all the assembly, uh, they were all happy. So they resolved to make a proclamation throughout the land of Israel from Beersheba in the south to Dan in the north that they should come and have Passover to the Lord in Jerusalem. So we talked about this last week that the runners, they were like telegram gospel messengers. And they told everybody, hey, come, God's doing a work, let's go. So everybody came, and I love verse 18. The multitude of the people, um, all these tribes, they ate the Passover, contrary to what was written. But guess what? Because Hezekiah, this godly king, prayed for them, saying, may the Lord, the good Lord, it's not a, a, a curse term, it's the good Lord, provide atonement for everyone who prepares his heart to seek the Lord God, or to the Lord God of his fathers, Though he is not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, he's like, may God just see your heart and just be merciful to you. And that's what he did. And it says in verse 20, the Lord listened to Hezekiah and healed the people. Beautiful, beautiful. Well, guess what? So they did this for about a week like they were prescribed. And they sang to the Lord, verse 21. They had loud instruments. Hezekiah gave encouragement to the Levites who taught the good knowledge of the Lord, which is what we're doing this morning. We're teaching the word of God. And they ate throughout the feast seven days, offering peace offerings, making confession to the Lord God of their fathers. Then the whole assembly agreed to keep the feast another seven days. I love this. They kept it another whole week. So they were so excited about revival that they celebrated for a whole other week. The whole assembly of Judah rejoiced Also, the priests and the Levites and all the assembly that came from Israel, sojourners came to the land of Israel, from the land of Israel, and those who dwelt in Judah. So there was great joy in Jerusalem. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there had been nothing like this in Jerusalem. Then the priests, the Levites, arose and they blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling place in heaven. It had been 215 years since Solomon. Long time. Maybe you feel like it's been 215 years since God worked in your life. <laughs> that doesn't make sense, right? God, I want you to move in power. It feels like it's been 215 years. It all comes down to if you turn to the Lord, if you turn yourself to Him, He'll return to you. So wherever you're at, wherever you want to be, just turn to him and say, God, I want, I want a fresh start. That's what they did. And it was re- resulting in worship, adoration, and praise. Whole two weeks of their lives set apart for the Lord. <clears throat> you might think about vacation time. Most employees, when they start out, they get two to three weeks of vacation. Imagine using all of your vacation just to worship the Lord in Jerusalem. And that's what they did. <clears throat> different times, different culture. But still, that's a long time to be waiting on the Lord. Now, when all this has finished, it was finished, all Israel who were present went out, of the, out to the cities of Judah and they broke the sacred pillars and pieces and cut down the wooded images. They threw down the high places, the altars from all Judah, Benjamin, Ephraim, and Manasseh, until they were utterly destroyed, they utterly destroyed them all. Then all the children of Israel returned to their own cities, every man to his possession. So notice, when they worshiped God and spent time with Him, they wanted to tear down the idols. Hezekiah appointed the divisions of priests. According to their divisions, each man had his service. The priests, the Levites, for burnt offerings, peace offerings to serve, give thanks, praise in the gates of the camp of the Lord. So there were different orders and different priesthood responsibilities. The king also appointed a portion of his possessions for the burnt offerings. He gave a lot of animals that he had set apart to keep the evening burnt offerings, the burnt offerings for the Sabbaths, the new moons, and the set feast, as it was written in the law of the Lord. And as we read in the New Testament, Colossians says that these feast days, Sabbaths, new moons, were all a shadow of the things which were to come, which is Christ, and he's the substance. So all that Hezekiah was doing was really a pointing forward or a foreshadowing of Jesus who would come once and for all for us, and that's what we celebrate in this season. 
So he had tremendous amount of sacrifices and that is what Jesus did for us. He, he gave us what we could never afford ourselves. He gave his very life. Moreover, you commanded the people who dwell in Jerusalem to contribute support for the priests. So we talked about that last week as well. So they, they could dedicate themselves to the law of the Lord. We read in the book of Acts that James and John and Peter, they're like, we can't stop reading the, the word and praying to serve tables when the Hellenistic widows were asking for more distribution. So that's why they appointed the seven deacons with Stephen, Philip, and five others. So the priests had to be able to focus on their jobs. So there were, there were incomes that were put into place. And the children of Israel, Judah, they dwelt in the cities of Judah. They brought the tithe of the oxen and sheep. Tithe of the holy things were consecrated to the Lord, their God, and they laid in heaps. So we talked about tithes last week, that a tithe is given to the Lord because you realize the Lord owns everything. And Azariah, the chief priest from the house of Zadok, he answered him saying, Since the people have begun to bring offerings into the house of the Lord, we have had enough to eat. We have plenty left. For the Lord has blessed his people and left, left, uh, what is left is this great abundance. Wouldn't that be great? And we're, I think we're on the verge here at this church to have our debts paid in such a way that there will be an abundance. And what a great blessing it's going to be in a very short time that we'll be able to sit around and say, what do we want to do with this extra money that we have? And hopefully we bless the poor. We reach out and do outreaches. We go to the schools. We go to the shut-ins. We go to the nursing homes. We disciple others. We help the, those who are incarcerated and impoverished. And we set the captives free. Now Hezekiah commanded them to prepare rooms in the house of the Lord. And they prepared them. You have all these names of people here. And we read them last week. But basically, they had different jobs and responsibilities to oversee the offerings that were given to the Lord. Um, mentioned all these divisions here. Um, verse 16, besides those males from three years old and up who were written in the genealogy, they distributed to everyone who entered the house of the Lord his daily portion for the work of his service. Could you imagine a little four-year-old Levite walking around, right? Three years old and up. You see my kids running around here when we're practicing, right? They own this place, they think. So it's just a beautiful thing that every age from four years old and up, you can imagine going all the way back to Hannah with Samuel. It's never too early to get your kids involved in the work of the Lord. It can be too late. It's never too early. Um, so it says, their sons, their daughters, the company of them, for in their faithfulness they sanctify themselves in holiness. Notice the Levites had no inheritance, no land, so they didn't have to be farmers so they could focus on the work of the Lord. The sons of Aaron, the priests, they were in the fields of the common lands of their cities in every single city, there were men who were designated by name to distribute portions to all the males among the priests and to all who were listed by genealogies among the Levites. So Hezekiah did throughout all Judah. And he did what was good and right and true before the Lord is God. I like verse 20. If you want to underline that, feel free. Hezekiah did what was right and true and good before the Lord. And in every work he began in the service of the house of God. This is where we left last week, which I wanted to kind of, for those who are new this week, weren't here last week. The reason why we went through what we did is this key verse 21. In every work that he began in the service of the house of God, in the law and in the commandment to seek his God, he did it with all his heart. So he prospered. Whatever we do, in the New Testament it says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of the Lord. Whatever we do for the Lord, knowing that we will receive a reward from Him. And if we do and we persist in doing good, God sees it and He will bless. Amen? It, just say, God, I give you my heart. God, search my heart. God, I give you my life. I give you my job. I'm working with these kids or I'm... I'm working with my own children. I'm working with my coworkers. Lord, you know my heart. 
Lord, I, I want to do better. Give me wisdom. We talk about wisdom when we study with the men. When you're praying for wisdom, you're praying to honor Him. Your kingdom come, your will be done, your glory, your kingdom, your power, Lord. And that's what Hezekiah had. So he prospered because God honored him seeking him. The Bible says, if you seek me, you will find me if you seek me with all of your heart. I think Jeremiah 33, but ask, seek, knock, Matthew 7, 7. So that brings us to chapter 32, 2 Chronicles. After these deeds of faithfulness, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, came and entered Judah. He encamped against the fortified cities, thinking to win them over to himself. So he's, he's besieging the cities of Israel. And when Hezekiah saw that Sennacherib had come and that his purpose was to make war with Jerusalem, he consulted with the leaders and commanders to stop water from the springs that were outside the city, and they helped him. And this is what I mentioned before we started the study this morning, is that there is Hezekiah's tunnel where the springs of the Gihon were diverted to, and it's still present today. So they stopped the water and the springs which were outside the city, they diverted it and they helped him. Thus many people gathered together who stopped all the springs and the brook that, came, that ran through the land saying, why should the kings of Assyria come and find much water? And he strengthened himself. He built all, up all the wall that was broken and he raised it up to the towers and built another wall outside. Also, he repaired the Milo in the city of David and made weapons and shields in abundance. Now, what is not said here, I don't think it's recorded in 2 Chronicles, but is that he gave Sennacherib a multi-million dollar check, so to speak. He said, here's some money. Please leave us alone. And Sennacherib said, ha ha, I'll take your money, but I'm not going anywhere, all right? So he basically wasted his money by trying to bribe. And we talked about that on Friday night. Like maybe a bribe will turn away wrath. That's what Hezekiah thought. It didn't work in this case. So he set military captains, verse 6, over the people. And he gathered together all these men to him in the open square of the city gate, which is like city hall, basically. And he gave them encouragement, saying, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid nor dismayed before the king of Assyria, nor before all the multitude that is with him. For there are more with us than with him. Now this is beginning to sound like Elisha, the prophet who opened the eyes of his servant to show him, Lord, open his eyes to see the angels that are with us, that there are more with us than there are with the Syrian army. Verse 8, with him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. That sounds like King David when he slayed Goliath, right? And the people were strengthened by the words of Hezekiah, king of Judah. You want to be a, an influence? You want to be a strong leader? You want to be a good parent, a good worker, a good uh, supervisor, a good man of God or woman of God? Then proclaim the confidence that you have through the strength and power and authority of Jesus Christ and watch people be encouraged. After this, Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, sent his servants to Jerusalem, but he and all the forces... With him laid siege against Lachish. To Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, In what do you trust? That you remain under siege in Jerusalem? Does not Hezekiah persuade you to give yourselves over to die by famine and by thirst, saying, The Lord our God will deliver us from the hand of the king of Assyria? Has not the same Hezekiah taken away the high places and the altars? His high, his high places and his altars and commanded Judah and Jerusalem saying, you shall not worship before one altar and burnt incense. Or you shall worship before one altar and burn incense on it. Do you not know that what I and my fathers have done to all the peoples of other lands were the gods of the other nations and of those lands in any way able to deliver their lands out of my hand? Who was there among all the gods of, of those nations that my fathers utterly destroyed that could deliver his people from my hand? That you or God should be able to deliver you from my hand. Now therefore, do not let Hezekiah deceive you or pers persuade you like this. 
and do not believe him. For no God of any nation or kingdom was able to deliver his people from my hand and the hand of my fathers. How much less will your God deliver you from my hand? Okay, let's recap that. Sennacherib is an Assyrian, probably speaking Hebrew, to the men on the wall saying, why is Hezekiah telling you you can't worship on your high places, his high places, that you only have to worship in the temple? Because that's true. (laughs) You should only worship the true living God. And he says, have any of the nations been able to rescue them from our hands? No, because God allowed Assyria to be raised up. He didn't recognize that the God of Israel was allowing him to have the power that he had. So he tries to discourage the people and he says, think about all the other nations. We're going to attack you. Don't let Hezekiah's counsel discourage you. He's basically saying, don't follow Hezekiah. We're going to attack. Meanwhile, his servants, verse 16, furthermore, spoke against the Lord and against his servant Hezekiah. And he wrote letters in Hebrew, by the way, to revile or hate the Lord God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people from my hand, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. So just like Goliath, he's trying to be terroristical. He's trying to be a terrorist with his language. He's making threats. Then they called out with a loud voice in Hebrew to the people of Jerusalem, here it is, who are on the wall, to frighten them and to trouble them that they might take the city. And they spoke against the God of Jerusalem as against the gods of the people of the earth, the work of men's hands. If you're struggling when it comes to spiritual warfare and dealing with people that aren't believers, I want us to understand something very clear from this teaching today. When they come against our God, which is the living God, the creator of the heavens and the earth, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God who sent his son Jesus to die on the cross, the Holy Spirit, the Father. When they come against that God, thinking that our God is just like all these other false, fake gods, demonic gods that really are powerless, truly they're revealing that they're powerless. Anyone who comes to you who does not profess True and genuine, sincere faith in Jesus Christ does not have the same power that we have, period. Can God use non-believers to rebuke us, to help us, to change us, to teach us? Yes. But ultimately, that should drive us to the true God to say, hey, even this ungodly person sees where I'm wrong and I can hear and listen to them and I can change. The Assyrians and the Babylonians, just like the Romans later, the Medo-Persians later would be, were God's instrument to discipline His own people because they were so wicked. And now, when they were coming to exercise God's discipline on His people, they took it a little too far and they crossed the line. They thought that they were stronger than God when they were simply used by God. The New Testament teaches it this way. For us who are believers, children of God, even we shouldn't have a higher viewpoint of ourselves than we ought. Right, Jimmy? Even you and I. We don't think we're better than anybody else. Although we're children of God, we treat others as more important than ourselves. Whereas the gods of this world will say, we're the most important, we're the best, and we're going to be bombastically, arrogantly, rudely, intimidating, like saying that we have all power and they have no power when it comes to the power of God. Satan can only do to you and I what God allows him to do. Amen? Satan is a created being. And so Satan's using this king of Assyria. And notice, there's little, almost demonic little minions trying to talk to people. Hey, on the wall. Hey, come with us. We're about to kill you. We're going to destroy you. Hey, by the way, can you open the gate down below? Something like that. If you've been to the wall, the Wailing Wall or seen pictures of Jerusalem, you can see the wall. And so the story goes, I think maybe when the Jebusites were conquered, that someone dropped their helmet off the wall and then somehow they, the helmet was picked up and they realized there was a secret passageway. So even to this day, there's underground tunnels in Jerusalem and there were, like I said, the diverted waters. They thought that Israel was going to be, be without water. Little did they know Hezekiah had plenty of water. So, Now, because King Hezekiah 
And the prophet Isaiah, this is very important. We read this in first or in Second Kings. They took these threats of Sennacherib, the Assyrian king. They laid them out before the Lord. I wrote a song about this. We've sung it many times before about it. But they threatened God's people. And so Isaiah and Hezekiah lay out this threatening letter, this terroristic letter. And the Lord that evening sent an angel who cut down every mighty man of valor, leader and captain in the camp of the king of Assyria, of the king of Assyria, he killed 185,000 soldiers in one night with one, one angel. God destroyed 185,000 soldiers. What about your God, Sennacherib? How strong is your God, Sennacherib? How about the God of Israel? So he returned, Sennacherib did, the king. He's like, all my people are dead. He's shamefaced. He's ashamed to his own land. And when he had gone into the temple of his God, which I think his God was like half man, half eagle, like an eagle-headed man, guess what happens? His two sons struck him down and killed him with a sword. Thus the Lord saved Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem from the hand of Sennacherib, the king of Assyria, and from the hand of all others and guided them on every side, or the other word there is it says, Gave them treasures or gave them rest on every side. Who wants to trust the living God and have rest on every side? Anybody? I don't see your hands. Who wants to have rest on every side? I see him now. Okay, sorry. I'm not trying to scold you. I won't rest on every side. But I'm going to have battles. Are you going to, have you had battles this week, anyone? Have you had trials and struggles this week? Absolutely. Are you still going through it? Are you still rejoicing through it? Satan hates when we rejoice through our battles and our trials. And he can't do anything about it. In those days, Hezekiah, we, we hit on this briefly, but he was sick near death. He had some boil. You know, it was gross, but he had a boil. They didn't know what to do. And he prayed to the Lord and he spoke to him and gave him a sign. But Hezekiah did not repay according to the favor shown him. For his heart was lifted up. Okay, hold on. If you want rest on every side, just remember who gives us the rest, right? Do not forget it's God who gets the glory. I like that it says here, um, just an observation from God's perspective, Ezra and the Holy Spirit are pointing out here, but Hezekiah did not repay him according to the favor shown him. Do we owe God our very lives? Do we owe Him our service and our worship? Is He worthy of everything that you can give until you are in glory? Absolutely. And Hezekiah had been spared so much. Imagine 185,000 soldiers right on your doorstep hollering at you, speaking, reviling. That'd be like ISIS on our doorstep. That'd be like Russia or China surrounding our, our home with their weapons of mass destruction and God just wiping them out. More so, he did not repay according to the favor shown him. His heart was lifted up. Therefore, wrath was looming over him and over Judah and Jerusalem. Because he was a leader and because he was not humble, the people suffered. The Proverbs say, when the righteous lead, when the righteous are in power, the, um, the people rejoice. But when the wicked rule, the people hide themselves. Then Hezekiah humbled himself for the pride of his heart, he and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the wrath of the Lord did not come upon them in the days of Hezekiah. Hezekiah had very great riches and honor. He made for himself treasuries of silver for gold, for precious stones, spices, shields, and all kinds of desirable items, storehouses for the harvest of grain, wine and oil, and stalls for all kinds of livestock and folds for flocks. Moreover, he provided cities for himself, possessions of flocks and herds in abundance, for God had given him very much property. This same Hezekiah also stopped the water outlet from the upper Gihom, which brought water, they call it Gihom, 
by tunnel to the west side of the city of David. Hezekiah prospered in all his works. However, regarding the ambassadors of the princes of Babylon, who they sent to him to inquire about the wonder that had been done in the land, God withdrew from him in order to test him that he might know all that was in his heart. So God kind of was like, okay, here's a test. Let's send these messengers from Babylon. Hezekiah is like, hey, let me show you my crib. Let me show you my ride. Let me show you all the toys and trinkets that I have. So sadly, his greed, his pride shone forth. And after that, the kings and leaders of Babylon, they went home and they said, hey, Israel's been blessed. Hey, Israel's got a lot of stuff. Hey, let's go get that stuff. Now the rest of the Acts of Hezekiah, all his goodness and his goodness, indeed they are written in the vision of Isaiah the prophet, son of Amos, in the book of the kings of Judah and Israel. We read those in 2 Kings. So Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and they buried him in the upper tombs of the sons of David and all Judah. And the inhabitants of Jerusalem honored him in his death. Then Manasseh his son reigned in his place. Father, we thank you. We look at the life of Hezekiah. We have a godly example and also an ungodly ending to be warned about. Help us to seek you with our whole hearts in every way. and Help us not to be prideful. In Jesus' name, amen.